Thanks for the introduction. Um, today I would like to report on the IFC Bridge project by Building Smart International. So first, if we talk about IFC, then we talk about open standards. So the question is, why do we need open standards? I guess that most of you know that, but I repeat it anyway. So um, open standards allow for fair competition uh, between the software vendors on the market. Uh, this competition results finally in better products and uh, in better prices, which is really important. In many countries, um, the public clients are actually forbidden to demand specific software products because this would disturb um, the market and destroy the market. At the same time, we have many, many success stories related to open standards, especially uh, in, in IT. Like for example, we have HTML, XML, SQL. Uh, when it comes to hardware, we have USB. Um, everyone who has an um, iPhone knows that the iPhone cables are usually much more expensive than the USB cables, which is a very typical example. <coughs> Then we have other more traditional examples for, for standards like A4 paper size and so on. When we talk about BIM standards, then it is super important uh, to know uh, what is the purpose of the data exchange we want to support with an open standard. Um, so on the one hand side, a typical use case is um, to provide a data drop for the client, um, which can be handled quite good by IFC. Another very good example is the coordination between different uh, domain experts, between the different planners we have in our projects. Again, IFC is very suitable for that. Then we have um, the data exchange across different design phases. This is maybe the most complex um, use case, where we have one software package where we did a preliminary design for a bridge or a building, and then another designer wants to use another software package he opens um, this file and he will find out that um, IFC might not support the full parameters. But we come back to this later. Uh, another example is archiving. Again, this is something which is quite well supported by IFC. So I talked about IFC already. Just for those that might not know IFC, IFC stands for Industry Foundation Classes. It's the um, big um, and widespread standard for supporting uh, the exchange of um, building models between different software packages. It is supported by many, many software vendors. It's not really new. It has uh, been developed since 20 years, actually. Um, but it was focusing so far on buildings. So there was actually a gap. And to fill this gap, uh, the Building Smart Infra Room was founded, um, I think, in 2010. Uh, the Infra Room is... Uh, kind of a subgroup of Building Smart. Um, its mission is to extend the IFC standard to cover also the build infrastructure. Its scope is um, to develop standards for roads, railways, waterways, um, including bridges, tunnels, and all kinds of facilities that are part of these um, infrastructure assets. All developments in uh, the infra room are done in close collaboration with OGC, the Open Geospatial Consortium, because uh, both GIS and BIM are super important for designing and managing uh, infrastructure assets. So it's really important to have harmonized standards to allow an easy transition between these two worlds. In the infra room, we started our developments with um, IFC alignment, something very important because for many, many um, linear infrastructure assets, you need the alignment to define, for example, the geometry. Uh, this one was not there before. Uh, for buildings, you don't need it, but for infrastructure, it's, it's essential, so it was the first part. We finished this part in 2015, and based on IFC alignment, we are now working in IFC bridge, IFC road, IFC rail, and IFC tunnel. The IFC bridge project was finished in March this year, IFC Road, IFC Rail are still running. Uh, they will deliver by the end of this year. And the IFC Tunnel project was just started a couple of weeks ago. All these projects uh, must implement this project structure. So this is really defined by Building Smart International. I will not go too much into detail here. We have, essentially we have a working group that um, defines 
um, the need of a new project. When this uh, need is documented, then the infracom defines a new project. Let me see if this works here. Highlight pet laser pointer. There it is. Then we have the infracom. They initiate a new project. It is handed over to the uh, project steering committee. They appoint a project coordinator, which in turn um, selects his project team. The project team is actually doing the work. They are developing the, the, the standard. Um, they are supported by an international expert panel. This can be up to 200 people from the entire world, uh, which are experts in this field. So they um, give input to the project team and they approve the developments there. When the work is done, then finally uh, we have a standards proposal that is handed over to the standards committee executive and then finally we would have a new BSI standard. So that's the general project structure. It really helps to have such well-defined structures. The actual project execution is then performed in a number of important steps. In our case, uh, it was we first had the requirements analysis and scope definition. Then we um, identified the semantic elements that we need for bridges and their properties, so we uh, defined the taxonomy. This taxonomy in our case was pretty much based on previous work from around the world, like the French uh, mine project, uh, from the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, also, we had information from Korea and China, and also the Seabridge project, uh, which was mentioned before, served as input uh, for these uh, developments here. Okay, after this exercise, uh, we started to develop the conception model. This is essentially a UML model based on IFC, um, reflecting any new entities, any new relationships and properties on the basis of, an, of uh, IFC. After that, this was maybe the most important step, um, we created the schema extension, we created sample models to validate uh, the, the, the schema extension, and finally, we officially published the scheme extension. So it was really these well-defined steps. Again, this really helped to conduct the project. The entire project was, as I said, um, carried out in close collaboration with the International Expert Panel. Uh, around 150, 160 experts were involved there from the entire world. Uh, we had 11 meetings with them showing intermediate results, and they gave us feedback, approved the results, and so on. So let's have a closer look on the individual steps. The first step was um, to define the scope. Super important because uh, then you really know what you can achieve in a limited uh, time and with limited resources. So we first analyzed the bridge types. So in the, in the world we have girder bridges, truss bridges, arc bridges, cantilever bridges, cable state bridges, suspension bridges. These are the most widespread bridge types. From them, the again, extremely most widespread type is um, the girder bridges. So we, de we define that we will focus on girder bridges because they make up around 90% of the, of the bridges in the entire world. Uh, we believe that um, all other bridge types can also be modeled by IFC bridge, but we did not test it. So our test cases were focused on girder bridges. Then we uh, defined the scope for the construction types we wanted to cover. Uh, construction types in bridge engineering are closely related to the um, cross sections. So in this case, we decided we want to support beam bridges, slab girder bridges, box girder bridges, so the most common types there. With respect to the superstructure geometry, it was important for us to um, cover the broad range of any super, superstructure geometry that you can find out there. So straight, haunched, incurved, etc. all should be supported. Then we discussed also material. So typical materials are reinforced concrete bridges, pre-stressed concrete bridges. This was important because pre-stressing systems are not very common in uh, buildings, but very common in bridges. So we had to work there intensively. We supported also steel concrete composite bridges, steel girder bridges, and steel bridges. So we defined these are the bridge times you want to um, cover. We discussed this with the expert panel and they approved our decision. Next step was um, to define a process map. I know it's very small here and you are not supposed to read it. We have it in the paper. Um, 
the reference process map was important because we wanted to um, define uh, the different stakeholders that we have in uh, bridge design and uh, management uh, project. So you can see these different stakeholders are in these swim lanes. And we have identified the typical activities they, they perform and where they hand over models to other partners. So uh, every time you see this number, it's actually a model handover that we wanted to address. Uh, we said this is a reference process map. It's not a standardized process map because we had a lot of discussion because every country does this a little bit different and we are not focusing on standardizing the processes. However, every country can find itself here and refer to this process map. So um, the reference process map was done, the, the basis for defining the most common use cases. So the exchange scenarios you have seen in the process map then have been translated in this table structure. And here you find um, a short description of the use case, um, the actual purpose, how exactly IFC is supposed to be used. We see the required geometry representation and the required semantic uh, information roughly described. Based on this table, we defined the priority, again, in close collaboration with the expert panel. So these 150 experts from around the world, they voted on the individual use cases, how important they are. And from the technical point of view, we um, assess the complexity of the use cases. So how um, complex is it to um, integrate that in IFC. You see a long list here, it's, I think it's in total 70 use cases that we have defined. Most of them are green, which means we decided to support them. Um, this includes initial state modeling, uh, technical visualization, coordination, uh, collision detection, for deconstruction sequence modeling, and so on and so forth. But now we come down to design to design. Um, here we had to distinguish two different use cases. One was um, you import a model from another application into your software tool and you use this as a reference. So you don't really change the geometry, but you use it as a reference in the background. So this is uh, designed to design as a reference model. Number 11, this is supported. But then we also have design to design where we uh, want to transfer the full model logic, including all the parametrics. But in this case, we said parametrics are not fully supported right now with IFC, and we cannot expect to integrate that uh, completely in IFC Bridge, so we defined this to be out of scope. This was really important because uh, in this way we could manage the expectations, and this was in the end also approved um, by the expert panel, the international. Okay, then others are also out of scope. Structure analysis, for example, would have been too complex for this limited amount of time code compliance checking as well, drawing generation and exchange based on IFC was also out of scope, as well as prefabrication and manufacturing. All of these use cases are interesting and valuable, but we had to cut somewhere because in only two years time, we cannot cover all the different use cases. Okay, then um, on this basis, on the basis of these uh, uh, use cases, we analyzed uh, the geometry that is available. So we grouped the use cases um, with respect to the question what kind of geometry description they uh, require. So we distinguish explicit geometry, procedural geometry based on profiles and alignment, and the full parametric description, which is not yet there, and other representations. Um, by doing this analysis, we could show that the available geometry descriptions are sufficient to describe the most important use cases of bridges. This was uh, the exercise, exercise we have done here. All these requirements have been then uh, published in the requirements report, was published in May 2018. Okay, then we started the actual work. Uh, we started to um, define the taxonomy. So we sat down with the experts from, from the entire world um, and uh, defined the terms they use for these uh, specific bridge elements. We um, took all these terms into a central Excel spreadsheet, I think it was Google spreadsheet maybe, um, and we tried to give it a structure. We had intense discussions, what is semantically equal, what is identical, uh, and so on and so forth. This was again a very important exercise to find consensus across the entire world 
with respect to the terms. What helped us a lot was figures, <laughs> pictures, and so on, because if you discuss on an international level, you will need to see what we are talking about to find also the, the respective um, terms. Okay, this taxonomy was then the basis to um, produce the domain model. Um, afterwards, uh, we took this as input to create what we call the conceptual model. The conceptual model is, as I said, a UML model based on IFC. Now we mapped all these terms, the entire taxonomy, either on existing IFC entities or we decided where we need new IFC entities. Um, this was then the basis to define the schema uh, because the conceptual model actually described everything which had to be extended. And this was then more or less formal step. Uh, in the end, we had the IFC extension, the MVDs, and the link to the data dictionary. Let's have a closer look on the conceptual model here. So, as I said, the conceptual model is essentially a UML model of the IFC schema extension. Here, the, the real, I would say, software engineering work was done when we created this UML model. So, we decided where to create new entities and where to reuse existing ones. We did this um, under strict conformance with the so-called IFC Info Extension Guidelines that have been published before. They say that you should uh, create as few new classes as possible because we have already 800 entities in IFC. We don't want to have another 800 for bridges. And in most cases, you can reuse most of uh, the available uh, classes, like for example, and an abutment wall essentially is a wall and IFC wall should be used to also um, model abutment walls. You should not distinguish there. What we did was we um, extended this set of predefined types. Uh, you can see this on, uh, on this slide. Here you see the new predefined types. For example, for the beams, we defined we have girdle segments, uh, diaphragm, pier cap, headstone, cornice, and edge beam. These were new predefined types, not new entities. We just extended the beam by new predefined types. And this uh, has been done for other elements as well. At some places, we had to introduce new um, entities, for example, for um, the spatial uh, hierarchy. So what is new now in uh, the conceptual model or in IFC, IFC 402, is the IFC facility and the IFC facility part. Um, we worked intensively across different projects on, on this concept. Nick was also involved, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, so now a facility is the new superclass of uh, building, but also of bridge, and a facility part is the new superclass of building story and bridge part. And this concept can be reused for many, many other uh, infrastructure facilities. Here you see how this is used. So now the project uh, contains a site. The site contains the bridge. The bridge uh, consists of different bridge parts. In this case, superstructure and substructure. The substructure itself consists of the abutment, the pier, and the other abutment. So you can really uh, create this hierarchical spatial structure. Also for the physical elements, we had to define some new elements. Most importantly, we had to define the uh, bearing. So IFC bearing is a new el uh, element because there was nothing like a bearing already in IFC. So you, this was really the case where we um, needed a new element. Uh, another thing we added was deep foundation because it was not there before and some, some more minor things. On this slide, you see uh, how, the, oops, yeah, how the bearing is uh, used. I don't go into detail, but now bearing is really the first class element of IFC. We also had to work on um, the pre-stressing system. As I said, pre-stressing is hardly used for buildings, but very intensively used for bridges. So we had to extend IFC there. So now there's an IFC tendon conduit, for example, to describe all elements of a pre-stressing system. We also checked the geometry. So um, of course we want to precisely describe the geometry of the bridges. And we have seen the use cases before. Many of the use cases depend on a sweeping of the cross sections along the alignment because this is the best representation that you can get of a bridge in the design. So, uh, 
uh, Janis might say for the digital twin, we need something else, but for the design, uh, this is really helpful. Um, so we checked if we can use the available uh, elements and uh, IFC section solid horizontal, which was introduced in IFC 4.1, provides enough flexibility and functionality to describe uh, the ge geometry of even very complex bridges. Okay, again, this was reported in the conceptual model report published in October 2018, approved by the expert panel. Um, so we could do the next step. Next step was then, as I said, quite formal. Now, when we had the conceptual model, it was straightforward how we should do the schema extension. So we created the first draft in October, the second draft in January, the third draft in March. It was necessary to define three different drafts because there are always minor errors in these extensions. If you don't do it absolutely correctly, then you will find errors. We identified some of these errors by uh, implementing simple sample models and ex uh, exchanging them between different software packages. So this really helped us to improve uh, the, the, the draft. The final draft is now official. As I said, we created a lot uh, of sample files. Um, they have the new spatial structure, they use the predefined type, types, they use the specific geometry and so on. Um, the draft standard, I see followed two, the official uh, draft standard is public uh, on technicalbuildingsmart.org, so everyone can see it, everyone can download it and, and implement it. However, we still have to undergo a number of formal steps until this becomes a really official standard. So Building Smart International has very much formalized uh, standardization process. So we are currently in the stage of a BSI draft standard. Very soon, within the next days, uh, it should become a BSI candidate standard if uh, certain um, uh, committees have approved the draft standard. And then we have another round of voting on the international level. And finally, it will become a BSI final standard. I guess it will become that in September this year. The next thing, of course, is that we have to bring it on the market because uh, a standard without implementers is useless. So we already started to talk intensively with uh, the main software developers, including Dassault, Autodesk, Tecla, Orplan. They have expressed interest in uh, quickly adopting uh, this new standard. So we will set up a de deployment project where we intensively support these uh, software developers to bring it quickly to the market. Okay, I'm almost at the end of my presentation, short conclusion. Um, we were able to um, successfully uh, define the standard in very short time, in less than two years. And what was very beneficial was the very structured development process um, with the different steps I've shown. This is now adopted also by other uh, projects. We had um, an intense consultation with the international expert panel. This was also very helpful. And the principle of earning uh, low-hanging fruits first and not trying to um, cover all use cases was absolutely critical. It was absolutely important to do it that way because otherwise we would still not have a standard. Of course, there's still room for improvement, so um, we would say that it would have been better to um, involve software vendors earlier, so this is something that we could take into account for the future. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions.